All right, welcome back uh, to our next session. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. James Grant. He's a lecturer in statistics at Lancaster uh, University. I'm really looking forward to this because this is a little bit different angle from some of the other uh, uh, presentations uh, we've had at the end of the day. He's been doing lots of work on math mo mathematical models for decision making and learning, and he's combining a range of ideas from statistics, operational research, and, and machine learning. So what we're going to hear about here is something called multi-armed bandits, which is basically about ways to actually optimize decisions and decision making. So James, on that note, I'll just hand over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So today, as, as we've said, I'm going to speak to you about mathematical models of iterative or sequential decision making. Um, so that is problems where you can repeat a task, observe your performance and hope to learn the best action. So I'd like to start with this uh, schematic, which for me sums up the data science pipeline at a very high level. Um, so oftentimes a data science project can look like the following series of steps. Uh, some data is collected and cleaned and processed, and this is pertaining to an aspect of the world that we're interested in. Um, and this is incorporated into a statistical or mathematical model or models which we train and test until we're satisfied is suitable to inform a decision making process. Um, and then we choose some action in this process and ultimately it has an effect of some sort on the world. So a very common concrete example of this is in terms of consumer marketing or the messaging that a business may send its customers. So we might collect some initial data as to which strategies are effective, build a model of customer response and use this model to decide which approach to take in the future hoping that it maximizes some kind of success criterion, so maybe revenue for the business or customer satisfaction of some form. However, increasingly, this view of a one-off decision-making process is, is kind of unrealistic or outdated. Um, and the decision that we take at this point here, um, it has an effect in the real world and continues to produce data that often is easily mined and easily merged with the data that we already have. Um, and allows us to update our model and even our decision in light of this additional information. This means, therefore, that we have the scope to iterate the decision-making process often um, in this manner and acting in the world in this kind of iterative way, um, which can hopefully allow us to improve our decisions as time goes on and converge to making optimal decisions in the future. That this is provided um, we make a suitable sequence of decisions along the way. So why this condition? Why this idea that our ability to converge to optimal decision making depends on decisions in the short term? Well, to reliably identify an optimal decision, we have to act in the world in a way that allows us to infer the value of all decisions that could be that optimal one. Um, what I mean by this is that following what we believe to be the most profitable decision in the short term won't always grant us the information we need to learn the best decision in the future. And there's a complex balance to be struck between experimenting enough to gain information to boost this data set um, and making decisions that will ultimately pursue profit. So to understand this, this kind of trade-off, this dilemma a bit better, we're going to consider this class of models that in the title of the talk called multi-armed bandits. So these are a class of models that take their name from casino slot machines like these in this, this graphic here. And specifically their role in the following kind of toy problem or thought experiment, which dates back at least as early as the first half of the 1900s. So I want you to imagine that you enter a room in a casino and in front of you, you find a row of slot machines like these, and they each have potentially, potentially have different probabilities of paying out. So for instance, these values here are the probability that if you play the slot machine, you'll, you'll win something. So I want you to imagine that you go into this room with a bag full of tokens, which you're going to put into these machines one at a time with the aim of winning as much money as possible but that you don't know initially what the payout probabilities are. You can only estimate them by playing these, these games. And so the question then is how do you sequentially trial these slot machines to maximize your winnings? So to illustrate this process a little more, um, 
give kind of an example. Um, so you might start with this one on the left, put a coin in and receive no payout. Then maybe you try the middle machine and you are successful. You try the one on the right and you are successful as well. So you then proceed to try the two that have given you some payout again. Um, and you see that you get a payout twice from this machine and one payout and one no payout from the machine on the right. You kind of proceed in this iterative manner and eventually you'll have built up a little bit of a data set corresponding to each machine. And you'll start to get a flavor for what their payout probability is. Um, and hopefully start to see that the most profitable option is this machine in the middle. So it's hopefully clear that there needs to be some element of exploring these various machines so that you can reasonably accurately estimate their payout probabilities. But to maximize return, there also needs to be some substantial exploitation of the best machine, this one in the middle in this case, once it's identified. Um, and striking this balance optimally um, and repeatedly, so in a, in a way that whatever these probabilities were, you would reliably find the best machine, is surprisingly challenging and has attracted a lot of research um, over, over particularly the last 20 years, but further back than that as well. And this is because approaches that may seem sensible initially can actually fail catastrophically. They can fail to even converge to selecting the best thing in, in the kind of asymptotic limit, let alone getting the balance right in the short term. So consider this simple greedy approach, um, which we're calling follow the leader. Um, so suppose that you, you start quite sensibly, play each machine once to initialize your estimates of their payoff probabilities. And following that, proceed on just playing whatever looks the best at that time point. So play the machine with the largest average payout so far. If the average payout of the machine that you're currently playing falls below the average payout of a different machine, then swap or follow the leader, essentially. So as an example, with, with what we've just looked at, if we'd um, initialized as before and seen no payout from this machine, one payout from this machine, and a payout from this machine, you may then say, okay, this middle machine looks good, I'll stick on it, get a payout from it, and so do the same again, and then see a no return from this. So this now has an average reward of two thirds, which is not as high as the machine on the right, so we would switch to that until such point as its average return falls below and we'd swap back to the seemingly more profitable action. So in this instance, it looks like this approach is on track to figure out that this yellow machine had the highest average payout. But imagine an alternative plausible scenario where the left machine actually has the largest payout probability. Let's say instead of 0.1, it was 0.6 but that we'd still seen the same initial samples from each of these machines. This is plausible, right? So if this payout probability was actually 0.6, 40% of the time, it's not going to pay out on the first trial. But if one of the other two machines did still pay out, we would never go near this machine again because its average payout of a zero at this point is always going to be lower than the payout of a machine that, um, the average payout of a machine that's showing you something. So you might say, okay, but this is a dumb algorithm. This is, this is not initialized very well, so it's bound to fail sometimes. Why don't you just sample every machine more than once? Sample it many times at the start to build up a good estimate, and then follow this approach of playing the machine with the largest average so far. So let's call this kind of exploring, then behaving greedily. Surely this has got a better chance of coming towards the right decision. Well, yes, it does, but it's still not perfect. Firstly, we could get really unlucky. We could get, you know, in this instance where we've started with six samples from each, we could still get six failures from an arm that um, turns out to be the best one or a low enough number of successes that we'll never really go near it again. But more than that, um, it require, this algorithm requires a specification of how many times to, how many times to sample each machine initially. 
And this is a non-adaptive specification as well. So if it turns out that the probabilities are really far apart and you can very quickly identify that this machine is really good, this machine is really bad, we don't need to bother with this bad machine, this algorithm as posed wouldn't pick up on that. And equally, if after some exploration, two machines are pretty close and we're still you know, not confident as to which is the best, it has a reasonable chance of just focusing on one forevermore and not doing enough exploration to discern which is the best. And this isn't ideal, and both of the algorithms that I've shown so far, I'm not going to show you how today because it will take a while, but they can be shown mathematically to be um, theoretically suboptimal. So how do we get this balance correct? Well, one successful approach among several others that I won't have time to mention today is to be optimistic. So rather than blindly exploring all the, the machines and not looking at the outputs that we've got until we come to some um, exploitative phase or staking everything on the best so far, we consider machines that have potential to be the best. Um, so we quantify this potential through a confidence interval around the probabilities of payout. And we focus specifically on the upper limit of these confidence intervals. So values that with high probability, the, the true payout rate is not above. And what this strategy, this upper confidence bound approach does is it picks the machine with to play at a given time point whose upper confidence limit is the largest. Um, so we've got a bit of an example here that illustrates the phenomenon that makes this approach successful. So we've got um, some different estimates of the payout probabilities of these machines, um, and they've been played different numbers of times. So this means that our confidence interval around the, the probabilities of payout for these machines are of different widths. So you can see it's quite narrow here for the machine that we've played a lot and quite wide for the one that we haven't played as much. So if we were to then look at the largest of these and play the machine with the largest confidence interval, we choose this machine on the left on the basis that it's got a lot of uncertainty. And once we've played it more, and once it's, its confidence interval has shrunk a bit because we've not got as much uncertainty, we'll eventually switch back to playing the, the machine that is um, the optimal one because it will have a large, a high confidence interval um, because it's just got a large mean payout, but we'll do this confident in the knowledge that we've kind of ruled out some potential for this to be the best machine. So what does all this talk of slot machines have to do with anything useful? Well, there's a parallel that hopefully you've spotted between this challenge of learning which machine is the best and many real world problems where we may wish to learn an optimal action in an iterative fashion. For instance, in a clinical trial, um, alternative drugs may be analogous to the slot machines, um, and trialing those drugs on patients are equivalent to putting a, a token in that machine and seeing if we get a reward, with patient outcomes being the feedback and rewards. These can be particularly useful in trials for rare diseases because there's a small population of people to be treated and a tension between exploring the value of these and figuring out which is the best. Perhaps a lower stakes, but um, very common um, application is to online advertising, where different products can have different associated click-through rates and a business may trial different adverts on different customers to learn which is, is the most profitable. Finally, the choice between different data science or machine learning models can be viewed as one of these bandit problems where we make decisions to use different models on different days and hope to converge towards an optimal framework. You may say, okay, the real world is more complex than this. We may have um, restrictions to take actions in batches or not receive feedback immediately. We may have changing parameters um, or model drift, and we may have more complicated sets of actions than just discrete sets. The good news is that the literature goes much beyond what I've spoken about today, and is particularly over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of development of taking this optimistic approach into more complex settings and tackling more challenging problems. My goal today has been to introduce to you that this kind of concept of sequential decision making and learning, and hopefully this will inspire you to think about where this may be applicable for you. 
So the last 20 seconds or so, just to show today's central message has been that when the potential to make decisions repeatedly arises, we can and ought to do better than just collecting data once, fitting a model once and hoping for the best. And that these optimistic techniques allow for an appropriate and optimal balance between the data collection and the optimal decisions to be struck. Thank you very much for listening. There's some contact details there if you ever want to reach out to ask more about this. Great, James, thank you very much. Once again, some really inter interesting insights in terms of uh, decision optimization. Uh, there are some days, I wish I had something like that implanted in my brain to be able to help with some of the decisions I've made uh, uh, over the years. But no, thank you very much. I think that really adds some value to some of the other presentations we've seen around AI, ML, and, and being able to utilize the data effectively in terms of being able to make uh, operational decisions. So I'll bring this particular session to a close, and I'll see you over on the next session in a moment where we hear from uh, Dr. Matt Lube Cushy from University of Suffolk. He's gonna talk about the, f the, the fourth age. So I'll see you there in a minute. Thank you.